Um, I'm going to be talking about our research project, which is based at Queen's. Um, I'll give you a little bit of context, first of all, about dementia and some facts around it, um, because it's important to know the facts before we look at how it's represented culturally. Then I'm going to talk about dementia in film and TV and fiction and the fact that there's a bit of a boom in it in our, um, our cultural representations. We're seeing dementia everywhere. Um, we're also going to address the main question of today will be how can the language of fiction specifically help us understand dementia? I'm a literary linguist. That means I specialize in the language of literature and I'm specifically interested in how literary language gives us a new experience or an alternative view on the world. Um, so we'll be looking at that question in detail. Okay, so I mentioned the fact that this research is based on a research project. Um, it's called Dementia in the Minds of Characters and Readers, and um, it's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. Um, as part of this project, we are a team investigating how dementia is represented in fictional language and how readers respond to that language more importantly. So how does it make readers feel? How does it make readers understand dementia? I am the principal investigator and we have a great team of co-investigators, including Dr. Gemma Kearney and Dr. Paula Devine, both social scientists who are based in um, the ARC Aging Programme. We also have Dr. Carolina Fernandez Quintanilla, who like me is a literary linguist and she specializes in readers' responses to literature. And um, we're very lucky to have on board Jan Carson as our outreach officer, but her main job, of course, you might know her as a very successful novelist. Um, and she's particularly interested in her writing and how we represent um, aging and, and dementia as well in, in literary works. So it's great to have Jan on board as well. Uh, we're working with the, the couple of charities, Dementia NI and the Alzheimer's Society, who are helping us make sure that our, our project is relevant and, and, and makes sense. Um, so you can see we have a website there and we're on Twitter as well. So free, uh, feel free to tweet us. Um, I'm gonna share a list of resources at the end for anybody who wants it with the websites and the sources mentioned today as well. Okay, so that's our project and that's what a lot of this research is, is based on. Um, I did say we're going to start out by talking about some facts about dementia and probably the most urgent and important fact is it's on the rise, okay? Um, now, I say that with some sense of urgency, the World Health Organization have labeled it as a priority, a, health, a public health priority um, all around the world. So it is, it's important that it's on the rise, but it's also important that we get a handle on it culturally and socially to understand it, okay? Worldwide, there are around 50 million people who have dementia and there are nearly 10 million new cases every year. Um, as age is the greatest risk factor for dementia and life expectancy is rising, that's why the prevalence is on the increase. Um, another statistic for you from Alzheimer's Research UK is that 24% of men and 35% of women born in 2015 will develop dementia in their lifetime. I have a child born in 2015, so that statistic really hits home for me. But if you look at how, how much it's going to increase, you really need to consider how are we going to cope with this? Now, of course, we need a cure and that we don't have. So what we need in the interim are social and cultural ways to respond to it. Um, thinking about the causes and symptoms then, because we're going to be looking at how some of the symptoms are represented in literary language today. Uh, Dementia, it's a general term used to describe a range of diseases that can contribute to cognitive impairment, okay? So it is a, uh, there's many different kinds of dementia, which include Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, even dementia induced by alcohol. Um, it is a disease caused by physical changes in the brain, which can be something to get your head around because we usually think of it as a, as a cognitive impairment, but it is caused by physical changes. And what brings on those physical changes are age, um, is the biggest risk factor, also genes, health and lifestyle factors, which can all increase risk. So uh, the general symptoms then, now I did say that it's a, a range of diseases. So of course the symptoms vary according to the, the type of dementia. 
but perhaps some of the, the most common ones. Um, memory loss. So this is usually short term memories and can um, it can be seen in conversation when it comes to repetition and things like that. Uh, difficulty concentrating and problem solving. Language problems, which can be finding the right word or even um, more generally following a conversation or comprehending. Um, it can cause confusion and disorientation to do with time or place, but also to do with people, not recognizing people. And it, uh, this one's not usually known so well, but it can also cause visual perceptual difficulties. So difficulty understanding the differences between uh, color contrasts, what's a shadow and what's not, uh, judging distances and reflections. So quite a wide range of symptoms. Uh, I'm going to pose my first question in the poll, so bear with me while I try and figure out how to do it. Um, here's a statement for you. If one of my parents have dementia, I will get it. Is it true or false? So just to see if this works. Let me see. Yeah, I think I've launched the poll now, so you should be able to see it. Can you answer, is that question true or false? We can also see as the results are coming in, uh, we can see how everybody's responding. So it, you might be influenced by, by what the majority is saying. Um, I'm going to end the poll in about five seconds. So we'll just give you a few more seconds to answer. Two and one. OK, I'm going to end the poll. I think we have an incredibly informed audience in today uh, because most of you have said it's false. It is false indeed. Um, the thing is that dementia is not purely genetic. It's a common myth that it's purely genetic. Um, in other words, if a person's family member has a dementia diagnosis, um, they are not guaranteed to develop dementia later in life. This is not true. So although there's a genetic component to some forms of dementia, the majority of cases don't have a strong link. Um, I think we all think a lot about early onset early onset Alzheimer's, which is uh, partly genetic. So um, the thing is that early onset uh, Alzheimer's only occurs in about 5.5% of all Alzheimer's cases. And uh, so it's, it's kind of blown out of proportion in the public perception, which probably feeds that myth a little bit. Um, but well done, I think we have a very well-informed audience in today. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about uh, the myths around dementia, that's quite a useful website there at the bottom. Um, okay, so we've started to talk a little bit about the myths around dementia, and it's incredibly important that not only the medical information about dementia that's out there, but also the understanding about what it, what it means and how we deal with it is improved. And this was put forward by the, the World Alzheimer's Report 2019. It was, well, it was published in 2019, but it was many, many years of research into attitudes around dementia around the world. Um, and it's probably the, the biggest study of, of that ilk um, that's been carried out. Um, one of their conclusions was that stigma and knowledge issues around dementia are evidently still major barriers. So what they said is it is essential to take action to improve awareness, to help dispel lingering myths around dementia and ultimately aim to reduce or even eradicate stigma. OK, so that's their aim. Um, some uh, social researchers have found that uh, cognitive impairment has an intimate and complex relationship with social connections and loneliness. So in effect, we're not quite sure whether dementia causes people to become lonely or whether loneliness and social isolation, which has been all too common in the last year, trigger cognitive decline. So it's an interesting link between the both. Whatever way it goes, societal responses to dementia are so important because we have to address that, that loneliness and that social connection that's necessary um, uh, to avoid it or, or to make it experienced in a lesser impact. So the science of dementia is emerging. There's no vaccine, there's no cure. So for now, we need the humanities and arts approaches, which are all about culture and connectedness to help us understand how to live with dementia. And like this, phrase live with dementia. It's been a catchphrase in recent years, but arguably the burden of responsibility is not on the person who lives with dementia to cope with it, but on society to cope with it and to learn how to deal with it. Okay, so we're going to be talking a little bit about how you can do that today. Um, 
I got interested in this project uh, and this idea because I one of the things that started it off, I read the Dementia Guide, which is published by Alzheimer's Society um, a few years ago when I did one of their training sessions. I, I was a participant. Um, and I noticed that it said this uh, as advice for carers. Okay, so let's see. The person's world will be very different to yours. So try to see things from their point of view. They're talking about a person with dementia rather than expecting them to see it from yours. Put yourself in their shoes. Try to understand how the person might be feeling and how they might want to be cared for. Listen and observe carefully. Now, I thought, I mean, it's, it's great advice, it's good advice, but how on earth do you put yourself in someone else's shoes? How do you see things from someone else's point of view? And because of my, my expertise is in literary language, I thought, well, literary language is one of the only ways I know of being able to do that. Um, so that's what we're going to turn to today and see how we can do that. Um, probably because dementia is on the increase and probably because we are talking about it more, there's a boom in cultural representations of dementia. You um, might have already noticed um, Humans, when we try to understand something, we create art about it and we write about it and we make films about it. Um, on this topic earlier this week, the Three Nations Dementia Working Group ran a webinar on the topic of media representations of dementia. I think it's available to view online now. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but if you're interested, you could follow up on that from my list of, of sources. Um, so with this boom in cultural representations of dementia, you've got lots of films. A couple of those were just out last year. Um, I think the, the, the Father with Anthony Hopkins and Olivia Coleman was nominated for lots of Oscars this year. And of course, some of these are based on novels, uh, which is what I'm more interested in. So uh, Burnt Sugar, for example, is Abney Doshi, Doshi's debut novel, and it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 2020. Um, just for your information, um, great reviews of the, many of these titles, including the films, are on our blog, which um, Jan Carson curates, and she's putting up reviews of these kinds of things all the time. So if you're interested, you could have a little look up there. Um, okay, so this is the fiction as well that, that's come out in recent years. Plenty of it, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, I did say we're going to turn most of the talk we're going to be addressing this question how can the language of fiction help us understand dementia now in order to address this question we're bringing together quite a few different disciplines um, i'm not going to go into detail on them all today but just so you know we'll be thinking about the language of literature so that's linguistics and literary studies we'll be thinking about how minds are represented and how readers respond to those minds so that's cognitive science and cultural gerontology deals with how do these literary representations help us better uh, understand and improve awareness about aging and about dementia as a part of life? Um, so those are the kinds of issues we'll be looking at today. So moving on to uh, what fictional language can do for us. Um, in Some scholars talk about reading uh, as a process of trying on minds. So that means that when we read, we try on characters' minds. Some would go so far as to say that that's what novel reading is. When you read a novel, you get to try on minds. Um, I love this idea. I think it's particularly interesting. Uh, Sunshine in 2006, she said it's one of the main reasons people enjoy reading fiction is because it allows us to try on minds. And those are her words. Um, so, Reading fiction is great because it's one of the only ways to access another person's mind. And therefore literature offers a platform of understanding other people. Um, that's what I would argue anyway. And today I'm gonna to show you the tricks that a literary language can do to let us get inside other people's minds. If you think about it, you know, we are all individuals. It's very hard to know what another person's thinking. Reading a book is one of those only ways that you can do that. Um, this kind of, uh, in, in the theory on empathy and how empathy works, it's said that before we can empathize with another person, we first have to be able to understand and not just understand, but simulate their experience to try and live through it, put yourself in their shoes. Um, informative language like you might find in a pamphlet or on a website, it might be able to tell us about dementia, 
but only creative writing can simulate it. So I would argue that only creative writing can give us a window to really empathize. Um, and that's what we're hoping today. So just to gauge the audience again, I want to ask you another poll question. Um, so let me just launch it. When reading fiction, have you ever felt like you're experiencing things just as the character does? Have you ever felt like you're trying on a mind, so to speak? So um, let's try poll two. I realized I didn't share the results with you before. I'll do that this time. Okay. When reading fiction, have you ever felt like you're experiencing things just as the character does, that you're trying on minds? No problem if you don't really read fiction and no problem if your answer is no, that's fine. <laughs> OK, I'm going to give you a few seconds more to see how the audience respond. Five, four, three, two, one. I need a, a countdown clock, that would be good. OK. The vast majority bar uh, one person has said yes, that you have felt like you're experiencing things just as a character does. So perhaps that claim that is on the, at the top of this slide, that that's one of the main, main reasons why people read fiction, perhaps there is a ring of truth to it. Certainly anecdotally and on a personal level, I would agree with it. And as with the, the majority of you, you can, you can see the results there. Okay. Um, so this happens, trying on minds happens through tricks of language. And for the rest of this talk, we're going to explore four of those tricks of language. OK, so the first one is the choice of narrator. OK, and um, we'll look at that in more detail. The second one are viewpoint strategies. OK, get rid of that. And the third one is iconicity, They're probably a new word to most of you. So I'll explain that in some detail. And the fourth one, the fourth one is linguistic creativity. OK. So let's look at the first one, choice of narrator. This is probably pretty straightforward for most of you. You might be familiar with the fact that you can have a first person narrator or a third person narrator. But you can also have a second, but it's less common. So just to give you a recap on what that is, first person narrator is I, I walked into a bar. There's a, a, an image to give you a sense of what that's like. I think we would all love to remember what it's like to walk into a bar and in the first person. Um, equally in the third person, that would be fine. He or she walked into a bar and there's an image to give you a sense of what that's like, a more exterior point of view. So this is a, the, the main option in fiction is it the choice of narrator. I'm going to set you a question again. Which one do you think allows you better access to a char character's mind, given that we're, we're all about trying on minds today? Um, I'm going to launch this poll question now and give us a sense of what you think. First person narration or third person narration? Which one gives us a better access to a character's mind? Okay, plenty of votes coming in. Bit of a mixed bag. I'll, I'll share the results with you now in a minute. I'm going to end the poll in a few seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'll share the results with you. So hopefully you can see those now. The vast majority of you, as I would have expected, chose first person narration. And even if you look at the images that are there on the slide, First person narration, sharing the I is sharing the, the space with that narrator. The character and the narrator are one and the same. So you would expect that it does give you better access to the mind. Um, I'll just close that. I'm going to show you some examples so we can explore how this works. First person narration, it does give you first hand access to a character or narrator's mind, but Third person narration can be used to move in and out of different characters' minds. It can also be used to express things that a character might not be able to verbalize um, at that moment. And it can also be used to blend viewpoints, which I'm gonna talk about. So research into how these kinds of narration are experienced, um, it's a bit mixed when it comes to understanding the results. So whether better engagement is with first person or with third person, because it depends on so many factors to do with the text, to do with how um, the content and how the readers respond to that, whether you have experience of that particular feeling, all of those kinds of things. 
Um, so to explore this a wee bit more, we're going to look at an example from Elizabeth is Missing, um, a novel which features Maud, a first person narrator with dementia. Okay, so here it is. I'll just read it now in a little second. So this is first person obviously with the use of eye. When I open my door, I can hear a roaring noise. I can't think what it is. It gets louder the further down the stairs I go. I stop on the bottom step, but I can't see anything. I look in the sitting room. The roaring is even louder. I wonder if it is in my head. If something is coming loose, the noise swells and vibrates, and then it stops. So of course you'll notice the use of the first person I. You might also notice the use of the present tense, which is not really the norm in fiction, but our research has found that it's common in fiction that represents dementia. And um, this might be because present tense lends a sense of immediacy to a narrative. So we, we feel like we're in the same temporal space as the character. But we were asking about the difference between first and third person. So let's try a little experiment. What happens if we change this to a third person narrative? So I'm sorry to the author, Emma, Emma Healy, but I, I'm just going to have a little bit of a, a manipulation of her text. Um, and hopefully you can see that now. So this is a modified version of the same text. And I'm just going to read it out. And I want you to think, do you feel like you still have access to Maud's mind? In fact, I'll open that full question now so that you can answer it while I am reading. OK. So when she opens her door, she can hear a roaring noise. She can't think what it is. It gets louder the further down the stairs she goes. She stops on the bottom step, but she can't see anything. She looks in the sitting room. The roaring is even louder. She wonders if it's in her head. If something is coming loose, the noise swells and vibrates, and then it stops. Okay, so most of you, I think, have answered that question now. Anyone who still wants to answer after we've read it, do you feel like you still have access to Maud's mind, even though we've changed it to third person? How is your, what's your response? Let me know in the, in the polls. Quite mixed. I'm going to end it in a few seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'll share the results there with the audience. The majority say yes. So even though we've now got a third person narration, most of you still feel like you've access to Maud's mind. We're going to explore why that might be in a moment. Some of you have said no, which I'm quite interested in. It's larger than I would have thought. Um, so you feel like now that it's been switched to the third person, that you don't have the same level of access, which would support what you said earlier about the fact that first person narration gives you more access. So I'm interested in that. Um, so let's move on and see, close the poll, uh, why it might be. Okay, so with viewpoint strategies, this is what we can do. In answer to our poll question, some third person narratives, especially those which adopt a blended viewpoint strategy, can give us privileged access to characters' minds. It can even maybe tell us more about their experience than they might be able to in that moment, as I've already mentioned. I've used this picture on the slide because this is what I mean by a, a blended viewpoint strategy. Um, basically, you're looking out to a, a horizon, but you can also see interior as well. So a blended viewpoint strategy means you can see inside the character, but you're looking from the outside in the third person narration, he or she. Okay, so it's kind of both. Those are some technical terms for what it's called, but I'll not get into it too much. And this kind of blended viewpoint, seeing inside and outside of a character, it's impossible outside fictional narrative. You can't do it any other way, which, as you can tell, gets me quite excited. But also, I think it's one way of really understanding someone's mind. Blended viewpoint is also quite useful for representing dementia because Dementia is a condition which challenges the cognitive and linguistic systems. So if a character is not able to express um, how they might be feeling in that moment, then the external narrator can do that for them, but also give us a sense of, of, of how they're feeling. So it's got to do with both at the same time. Research shows that the first person narrator doesn't necessarily always better allow readers to align themselves with the character. So this third person narration can be quite useful or interesting. Um, 
based on everything that we've covered there, when it comes to this boom in, in fictional representation of dementia that I mentioned earlier, you can see that I've circled a certain uh, number of those texts. And that's because in our research, we're focusing on this kind of fiction, which allows intimate access into the minds of characters with dementia. So that would be through first person narration or through third person with these kind of internal viewpoints. So in other words, I'm interested not just in fiction about dementia, but fiction that shows people's inner experience of it as a way of increasing awareness um, around dementia. So with this in mind, I have analyzed almost half a million words of fiction representing the cognitive experience of dementia. So using the same example from Elizabeth is Missing, we're now going to give you an idea of how this kind of fictional language can simulate an experience for readers, which might then facilitate empathy and awareness. Um, I mentioned the four tricks that I was going to talk about earlier, so we're now moving on to, to number three, which is iconicity, okay? So iconicity is when language represents an event in the order and or the manner in which it is experienced, okay? So in other words, the event is mirrored in the language form. Some aspect of the event is the same in the language form. Just to give you an example above there, the boom in capital letters, um, the loudness, if you like, of the, the volume of the boom is represented in the way that the, the word is formally represented on the page. So that's iconicity. Returning to this example that we have from Elizabeth is missing, there's quite a lot of it here, which is why I think many of you still felt like you were inside the mind of the character, even when we put it in the third person. Okay, it's back to the first now. I've, I've finished manipulating with Emma Healy's uh, creative writing. So, uh, yes, we, we've already covered this paragraph, okay? The noise swells and vibrates and then it stops. I'm gonna put a question to you, but it's not a poll this time. If you have any answers, could you put them in the chat? And also, if you have read the book before, don't give the game away, okay? So what is the source of the roaring noise that Maud hears? Can any of you guess, do you know? Um, if you've read it, as I said, don't give it away. So, okay, wind, someone says, good guess. No idea, says another, <laughs> which pretty much uh, kind of sums up the sense of disorientation, I think, that this, this text gives us. Traffic passing, another good guess. Okay, thanks all. I think, yes, someone got it. Well done, Mel, it's a hoover. And it's not an internal sensation, but that's really interesting that you said that. So I will just give you the, the last, this is the last uh, part of this extract as it continues. There, that's your hoovering done anyway. Helen stands by the dining room door, winding up the wire and the vacuum cleaner. So well done, Mel Engman, it is indeed a hoover. Um, but I think what that shows is what's happening here is iconicity. We are experiencing the noise and the uh, disorientation and confusion around its source because of the way the narrative is structured, okay? We're just as confused and disoriented as Maud is, Helen, by the way, is her daughter, because uh, she's unsure of the source of the sound, of the sense of the, of the sound, as are we. So we're invited to share in her cognitive experience, if you like, and that's iconicity. And in this case, what it's got to do with is the organization of events and knowledge in, in the narrative. But, there are, there's much more iconicity going on in this passage as well. I'm just going to point some of it out. The verbs are sequenced in the chronological order in which they are experienced by Maud. Um, however, she doesn't seem to concede that the noise is getting louder because she's moving towards it. This sense of cause and effect is missing from the syntax. And therefore, we have the same lack of understanding around the, the cause and effect that's going on here. So just to point that out, that's where it is. Um, also, if you notice, she lists questions a couple of times. I wonder if it is in my head, if something is coming loose. So that gives another sense of repetition, the repeating of ideas and questions that's going around her head is mirrored in the language. If you notice as well, at the end uh, of this paragraph, it says the noise swells and vibrates and then it stops. Now, you'll probably remember from school, you were told never to start a sentence 
with the word and. Creative writers love to break the rules and they do it for effects like this because it, it's an abrupt end to the paragraph, but it mirrors the abrupt end to the sound and that's iconicity again. Okay, there's one more example I want to show you. Uh, here you'll find the speech of Helen, her daughter. It interrupts the, the passage, uh, the way it's laid out, and it mirrors the fact that it interrupts Maud's thoughts, where she's trying to figure out where the sound comes from. Um, so there again, the experience is represented in the form, and that's iconicity. Okay. Um, I'm now going to move on to the fourth language trick that helps us try on lines. Now, it's a big one. Linguistic creativity, it's massive. There's so many ways to be creative with language. Um, I've just kind of mentioned one in the last slide. So what we're going to do today is only focus on, on metaphor because it's something that most of us um, remember from school. Uh, the thing about metaphor uh, is that it's everywhere and it's not always creative, okay? So if you think about the fact that, well, we use metaphors all the time, and a very uh, basic one every day is life is a journey. OK, so we talk about bumps on the road or having um, different avenues that we could choose. Um, and the reason why we use metaphors for this particular one, uh, life is a journey, is because that life is pretty hard to define and to conceptualize and to talk about. It's quite difficult. You've got many years and uh, many ways of living. But a journey uh, help, it's a more physical thing that helps to describe it in more physical, concrete terms. And in fact, that's the way metaphors usually work. We take something that we want to describe something that's a bit nebulous and hard to pin down. So we draw on a source that is um, more concrete and physical. Uh, so metaphors tend to work that way. And we tend to think of metaphors as only used in literature. But as I said, they are in fact everywhere in everyday language. They can be very telling about how we carve up the world and they can be ideologically loaded as well. When it comes to metaphors in literature, they tend to be less conventional and more creative, usually. Okay. However, in this particular example that we've been exploring, there are some metaphors, but they're pretty conventional. That doesn't say anything about Emma Healy's writing necessarily. Um, but just to look at what is there, I wonder if it is in my head, if something is coming loose, this is a fact that mind, the mind, which is quite difficult to conceive of, is matter with parts, the moving parts that can be used, it's a mechanism, so that's a metaphor. The noise swells and vibrates, in this metaphor the noise is treated as a physical thing, again taking something that's quite abstract, difficult to pin down and, and describing it in physical terms. However, these are not particularly creative metaphors, so they're not really helping us uh, think about creativity in literary language. In fact, they're more everyday commonplace ones. So I'm going to move on to a different text from uh, our study, uh, which has a, a really lovely example of a more creative metaphor. Now, in order to give this a little bit of context, I have to describe the novel, which is a beautiful novel. I would really recommend it. It's called The Madonnas of Leningrad. Um, and this novel switches between wartime Leningrad and the present day. So it uh, really describes Marina, the main character, her past in Leningrad, and then the present day, she's an old lady surrounded by family and she has dementia. Um, in her past, in, in the long chapters that describe her past, she was a guide at the Hermitage Art Museum before and during the siege of Leningrad. And she's so knowledgeable about art history and remembers every painting and every god and goddess that was represented in the beautiful art museum um, of what's now called St. Petersburg. Um, so in this extract that we're gonna look at, it's very short. She's an old lady at a family event and she's having lots of flashbacks about the art museum and all of these things she remembers in great detail, but she can't really, um, fully partake in the family event where she is. Um, so let's just put that in there. Um, when she turns away, a beautiful goddess in a flowing white gown offers her a slice of cake. She leans over and kisses Marina's cheek. Don't cry, Gran, she says. This is a happy day. So 
a beautiful goddess in a flowing white gown. I'm calling this a metaphor because that's not actually the person who's in the room. If you could put in the chat, uh, who do you think Marina is referring to? The beautiful goddess in a flowing white gown. Again, if you've read it, no spoilers, please. Okay, everyone seems a little bit stumped by that question. Okay, someone said her granddaughter, a carer, which is really, um, a granddaughter is a good one. The girl does say, don't cry, or the beautiful goddess says, don't cry, grand. So by that, we can intimate a, a reciprocal relationship. It is her granddaughter. Um, it's not herself on their wedding day, but it is a wedding day, well done. Her granddaughter is getting married and she, Marina um, doesn't have the ability right now to remember her granddaughter, her, her, the, the relationship, nor the name to be able to call her granddaughter, nor to fully understand that she's at her granddaughter's wedding. So all of that shows like the limitations on her cognition right now, that the, 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 the difficulties that she's having. However, by using this metaphor to describe what it is that she's seeing, a beautiful goddess in a flowing white gown, it's calling on the reader's knowledge of the fact that we know she has so much knowledge about art, art history. In her flashbacks, she references Rembrandt's painting of his wife as the goddess of spring flora. So we can understand as readers that she is filtering her the, the present stimulus, her present surroundings through her rich internal knowledge and long-term memories. Okay. Hopefully you're following that okay. Um, so because this is, a, I'm calling it a metaphor, basically she's describing her the granddaughter, her bride, uh, in terms of a, a goddess, that's the source to me. So because novels let readers in on a character's backstory, we have access as readers to all of those relevant memories that explain their current thinking and behavior. So reading and the flashbacks in there, let you see the many people that they've been at once, uh, understand the relevance of long-term memories to the present reality for people living with dementia. Um, and that's again, something that we can't do outside of literary reading. Um, so that was one example of metaphor and how metaphor in, in characters with dementia, it can draw on their knowledge from their past lives or from their earlier lives. Um, I'm going to read this one, which is also from the Madonnas of Leningrad. I'm not going to go into detail on the analysis. We're almost finished. But I just wanted to leave you with what I think is one of the most beautiful uh, passages that I've read from this kind of fiction. Uh, in this part, Marina is, is lost and very disoriented. Green, the word doesn't begin to describe this. For the moment, she forgets that she is lost that she is weak and chilled and the soles of her feet are tender with sores. She pinches the leaf between her thumb and forefinger and holds it up. It is breathtakingly beautiful, the first new green of the world, the light of creation still shining inside it. She studies it. Time recedes and she floats beyond it, absorbed totally and completely in this vision. Who knows how much time has passed? She is beyond the tyranny of time. This slow erosion of self has its compensations. Having forgotten whatever associations might dull her vision, she can look at a leaf and see it as if for the first time. Though reason would suggest otherwise, she has never seen this green before. It is wondrous. Each day the world is made fresh again, holy, and she takes it in, in all its raw intensity, like a young child. She feels something bloom in her chest, joy or grief. Eventually, they are inseparable. I think you would agree that is um, quite refreshing in, in how it makes you think about the color green, uh, about the world. Um, Marina's perception of some aspects of her immediate surroundings dulled, okay? So her physical sensations, she doesn't feel the, the weakness, the soreness. She's not aware of time. Time is treated metaphorically as a physical entity and a tyrant from which she can move beyond. However, her visual sensory experience is emphasized in various ways. The word green isn't sufficient to describe her experience of it, which instead connotes creation and light. Also, the word presupposes that all greens are alike, whereas this visual experience is unique for Marina 
expressed through the similes as if for the first time and like a young child. The ideas of life and creation are used again metaphorically to describe the emotions which bloom in Marina evoked by this vision. Again, labels are insufficient. The words joy and grief are inconsequential to her, for both are a part of life. Um, some scholars have described this, uh, this effect that's achieved here as a childlike vision with this language bordering on poetry and recapturing a pristine awareness of things. And I think this extract achieves a similar effect through creative language, making us slow down and think about life a little bit more differently. Um, so I'm just going to finish by thinking about how we've answered this question. How can the language of fiction help us understand dementia? Uh, first of all, I think, as we've seen, it puts us in the shoes or the viewpoint of a character with dementia. And that can be either first person or third person with a few other language tricks thrown in. Um, as I mentioned, fictional language, it represents the cognitive and affective, which is feeling, experience iconically in language. In other words, it doesn't just tell us what it's like, it simulates us. We, we get to experience at the same time in the same manner. Um, another thing, another trick, is that it uses figurative language, so for example metaphor, to help us understand a complex experience in alternative ways. And as the last example showed us as well, it slows down language processing. It makes us think and maybe reconsider um, our present reality. Um, so we're going to leave it there. I will take questions now in the question and answer. Also, if you have any questions that arise afterwards or if you want to email me about the project in general, feel free to do so. OK, so I'm just going to go and have a little look now in the question and answer. Sorry, I haven't been able to follow the chat at the same time. Let's see. Don't see any open questions there now. Maybe what I'll do is have a little look through the chat. Um, okay, I can see in the chat there, people responding very positively to that um, extract from the Madonnas of Leningrad. Would highly recommend it. It is a beautiful, beautiful read. Um, okay. Not sure if it is not working so well, but I can't see any open questions in the chat right now. Um, if you're all just a little bit shy and would like to put them by email, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'm happy to share the, the sources that we've used today and also to, um, to think about, um, to answer any questions to do with the research project. I'm just seeing that one question's come in here in the chat, so I'm going to respond to it. It's from Nathan who is currently writing a script for a VR experience about dementia. Would you have any tips for writing dialogue from the point of view of a person talking to the dementia patient? So that, uh, if, I, if I've got this right, it's not necessarily dialogue from the person with dementia, but a person talking to a dementia patient. Hmm, that is quite a tricky one. Uh, because essentially what you're asking me is the point of view of people who don't have dementia. Now, if you if you were talking about the dementia patient, I would recommend that you go and read um, there's plenty of literature out there on how dementia affects language. Um, but because we're talking about responding to, um, I think it's, yeah, as a linguist, I'm interested in how people express themselves in, in speech. So uh, if you wanted to talk to me about that, I could definitely answer some questions by email about that. Um, writing dialogue is, it's a, it's, if it's gonna be for a VR experience, you're not really writing it for a rhetorical effect. You're not really writing it for an enjoyment or a kind of fictional. I suppose it's more about recreating realistic speech in which case I can certainly talk to you about that from a linguistic perspective. Um, feel free to drop me an email. It's kind of a tricky question, Nathan, thanks. <laughs> I can see you said it would be the patient and the viewer would be said, okay, I, I'd be happy to talk to you about that um, a little bit more by email and, and give you my linguistic perspective if you want. Someone has suggested spending time with someone with dementia and their cares for dialogue. That's a, a, 
from an anonymous attendee and I would have to um, support that, you know, research is the best way to make sure that dialogue is accurate and representative. Uh, so thanks for that from anonymous. Um, I think there was another question that came in there. Yes, also from anonymous. Do you feel there is enough fiction out there to change public perception? It's a really interesting question. Um, as I mentioned, there's a boom in cultural representations of uh, dementia and this is in, of course in response to uh, a need we need to talk about it we need to understand it but the other part of that question is is it the role and responsibility of fiction to change public perception that's something that maybe needs a little bit more thinking about I don't think creative writers put novels out there uh, with the goal of changing public perception, they probably just want to deal with an, an interesting issue in an artful way. So yeah, I, in, in some respects, and Jan Carson, who's working on the project with us and is a writer, thinks about this a lot, the ethics of representation. So of course, fiction is uh, should be held uh, to some extent to, be, to represent dementia ethically um, and to make sure that it's medically accurate. But on the other hand, it's not the responsibility of creative writers to change all of our, um, our, our understandings and, and awareness of dementia. So it's, it's a tricky one. Um, there's a lot of fiction out there and some of it is, is not entirely medically accurate and some of it is more socially helpful than others. So I'm thinking for example, maybe to give an example would be best. Still Alice, for example, it's incredibly medically accurate because the author is a neuroscientist. Um, and it's it's really popular and I'm, I'm not going to dismiss it, um, but I think socially it's a little bit irresponsible in that it sets up um, the experience of dementia as something that is quite catastrophic and it sets the fall in uh, and decline um, in, in quite negative terms. So yeah, you've got something there that's medically accurate, but socially uh, maybe not so much. And then you might have other texts, other novels that are socially accurate, but maybe medically not so much. Either way, the writer needs to do some research and, and make sure that they're doing some honest truth and, and service to the topic. Um, Ruth has asked the question, have the authors of any of the novels you're analysing expressed interest in the research? No, I haven't contacted them. I should maybe ask Emma Healy if she minds the fact that I manipulated her language today. Um, it's a really good question and maybe I should put it out there to the novelists and, and see what they think of, of the analysis. It would certainly be interesting because we're looking to see what readers think, but maybe we should go back and see what the writers think as well. It's a really good question. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, I see we have a question from another anonymous who's asking, how did you choose which novels to include? I noticed you excluded a number of famous books like Burnt Sugar. Um, yeah, this was really hard. Um, I would have loved to include in the, in the uh, set that we analysed a lot more diverse voices. But I suppose the fact is that a lot of the fiction that's out there, or at least that we could find, depicts um, white old older ladies with dementia which is not representative necessarily so um it was we did want to include a, a more diverse range but that's kind of just what was out there the other thing that i had in my criteria for choosing what would be included and i did touch on this today was the fact that the fiction should show an interior perspective and that's either through the first person uh, or the third person with those particular kinds of um, internal viewpoints that I mentioned. So we did exclude things like burnt sugar because it doesn't get inside the mind of a character with dementia. So that um, that was a, a, a tricky one. We had to, to leave a lot by the wayside. But if you go to our website, Jan has reviewed those kinds of texts as well. Um, okay, I have another question from Ian. How does your team know what is an accurate or responsible representation of dementia? It's a really good question. And the, the truth is we don't, we don't know because what is accuracy when it comes to representation uh, in fiction? So with fiction, there's always gonna be a made up element. And of course, there's also gonna be the 
the fact that it's there as an art form first and foremost it as I mentioned before it doesn't necessarily fiction is not necessarily wholly responsible for accurately representing the world and we can't hold it to that to ransom like that on the other hand if an author is choosing to represent uh, something that is so socially important and that is a real challenge for so many people there is an ethical uh, responsibility to do it accurately but I still say that with a little bit of um, uh, sensitivity I suppose because as I mentioned before accuracy can something can be accurate in different ways so like I said still Alice is accurate medically but I think socially not so much because it, it really does um, represent a decline from her being a professor of linguistics to 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 really um, not it, it kind of points out what she's not anymore uh, to a great extent and in that way it's not very uh, socially accurate or helpful and um, hopefully that answers your your question a little bit and so accuracy is very difficult to measure and I, I wouldn't even try <laughs> um, because it can be measured in different ways is, is the answer really um, I haven't seen any more questions come in. So what I think I'll do is, uh, oh, I've seen one more, um, two more. So I'm gonna answer this one from Lynn. In your experience, do you find that dementia fiction is a popular genre or do people shy away from the topic? Um, as I mentioned, there is a boom in this. And cultural representations. So I don't think people are shying away from it. I think it is becoming more part of the conversation. Um, and that is a good thing. As I mentioned earlier, we need to, to talk about it more. We need to find ways of, of dealing with it because it is becoming uh, prevalence increasing. Um, so no, I don't think people shy away from it. We just need to talk about it in more honest ways and think about how we can respond to it and live with it would be my answer to your question, Lynn. Um, there's one more uh, question from an anonymous um, attendee who says, I was interested in the point you made about fiction being the only way to access the interior perspective. Can you think of other prep projects where you could use this method? Well, I know I did say that, and I, I would stand by that point that fiction is the only way to access this kind of interior perspective. However, I do know a film director who, when I made this point before, he entirely disagreed with me and said that with film, there are ways um, of showing viewpoint, for example, the way the camera points, um, etc. Uh, so there may be other art forms um, where viewpoint um, and the interior perspective can be uh, displayed in the same way as it can be in, in fictional language. Um, because I am a, a literary linguist, though, uh, I, I would still promote and stand by the claim that literary language is one of the best ways of getting inside the mind of anyone, um, and especially um, the mind of a character with dementia and for that reason it can be really useful in promoting awareness and understanding. So with that point and with no other questions in the q and I'll, I'll wind it up there but do feel free to, to drop me an email if you want to um, bring up any of the issues raised today. Thanks very much to the Imagine Festival for hosting this and to Richard for his work behind the scenes and to my whole team for their support in this research. So thanks very much, bye bye.